I'm Matt Dixon, and welcome to the Purple Patch Podcast. The mission of Purple Patch is to empower and educate every human being to reach their athletic potential. Through the lens of athletic potential, you reach your human potential. The purpose of this podcast is to help time-starved people everywhere integrate sport into life. So you've got your strength training, you've got stress levels and inflammation, you've got the myriad of supplements that are available, foods that you need more of, maybe foods that you need to limit, red flags to course correct in your health and performance. There is a lot to consider. It's almost impossible to keep up, but knowledge is power. And with the assessment of your biomarkers combined with the insights and recommendations from the team at Inside Tracker, what you get is focus. You get precision as well as trackable metrics to ensure success and improvement for sports performance, health, and of course, longevity. It's a great tool that I use and you might consider it too. You don't even need to be a purple patch athlete to do so. All you need to do is head to insidetracker.com slash purple patch and you can use this code purple patch pro 20 and you get 20% off everything at the store. All right, let's buckle up and dive in. I hope that you enjoy the show. And welcome to the Purple Patch Podcast. As ever, your host, Matt Dixon. And we have to start this week with an apology. Apology from the microphone, because I am away from the recording studio in San Francisco, and I'm also without my trusty microphone. You see, I'm on a family adventure across Europe, and we had some technical difficulties, but we didn't want to bypass this opportunity to present to you today's guest. It's Lena Tarms, and Lena is a Danish professional triathlete. In fact, she's a purple patch professional triathlete. But we're not going to go through one of those conversations about the athletic journey and all of the stuff that breaks down her swimming, cycling, and running. Instead, we're investigating a subject that can resonate with all of us, overcoming adversity. And the reason that I asked Lena on the show is because she is, in my mind, an exceptional human being, but she's also someone that over the last few years has had to navigate a tremendous amount of adversity, both athletically, but more importantly, across her life. And coming through it all, she's been a prime example of leveraging that adversity and emerging with lessons so that she can grow and become stronger. It's a fantastic interview. And because... I'm away, I'm on a little bit of a vacation, and I'm not with my microphone. We're going to skip all of the word of the week. We're going to skip the Matt's newsings, and I'm going to just go right to the interview. It's a cracker. And if you are feeling stressed, challenged, had to overcome some obstacles or failure, I highly encourage you to sit down and immerse in the wisdom of Lena Tom. She is an exceptional woman and a real inspiration and i'm very very glad for her to be on the show and so so that you don't have to deal with my crackly voice on this i'm going to hand it right over but i will get to say this it is the meat and potatoes All right, guys, it is the meat and potatoes. We have a very special guest today who has promised to be very well behaved, I hear. Line fams, or for the Danish people amongst us, let's do it correctly, Lena Tarms. Welcome, Lena. Thank you so much, Matt, and thank you for having me. Very humbling. We don't have the Purple Patch Pros on this show very often, but you are just that little bit special. We're not going to be talking about your athletics too, too much today. We're going to be talking and orbing our conversation around adversity, managing adversity. And many listeners, many of the audience will not know much about your story, but we are going to dig it apart today. And I think that as by the end of this show, you are going to be a source of great inspiration and learning for uh, for all of our audience. So thank you so much for being here today. Talk about me putting the pressure on you. Mate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, let's um let's get let's get going. And as I always do with every guest that we do have on the show, I like to have a little grounding, and this is really important for this topic of a conversation of really understanding who you are as a person first. So let's go let's go all the way back 
to the start, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience and, you know, tell me a little bit about where you grew up, your family, all of the good stuff like that so we can have a firm footing to start this conversation from. Yeah, uh, well, as you said, I am Danish. I'm from Denmark. It's a pretty small country of five million people. And I was born and raised in the southern part, so very close to Germany. And mm -hmm. it was a pretty small beach town. Um, and as, yeah, the entire Denmark, uh, most of the country is uh, surrounded surrounded by the beach. And... Um, yeah, I was, I'm the youngest of five. I was a pretty big nerd when I was a kid and I really did not like any kinds of sports or physical activity at all. Um, but yeah, time has changed mm. and I will probably always be a nerd, but now it is in sports science and obviously I've come to uh, enjoy being active quite a lot as well. Um, mm. So yeah, um, as I said, I, I really hated uh, PE classes and I was super afraid of water, which really wasn't um, great living in Denmark, mm -hmm. um, especially when when uh, I grew up and, and we as teenagers started going to beach and when all my friends went into water, I was too afraid to go with them. So I think that was when I kind of got stubborn enough to take up swimming classes, uh, even though then I would have to start with the toddlers um, and and jump around with them. Uh, and I think probably because I didn't enjoy, enjoy too much being with the toddlers, uh, I, I pretty quickly became a better swimmer. Um, and um, yeah, it, it just escalated quite quickly from there. And, and after a couple of years, I was, I was training more at an elite level. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think that was probably, yeah, uh, like coming to, to the topic of today, that was the, the first experience I had in leaning into a major challenge and then get rewarded by it. Um, yeah. Yeah, because it really took some bravery for me to hold my breath and do those first meters of swimming again and again and again. Um, and, and I think like something, something I heard, I've heard you say so many times is that it's really about those small victories that they build confidence. And I think in this case, I did get some confidence in being brave, leaning in over and over again. And when you don't get rewarded, like in this case, I got less and less afraid of, being in the water, uh, it still comes sometimes, but I, I'm fairly okay with swimming now. Um, uh, <laughs> but then it's just easier to act brave, bravery, uh, or bravely again brave, yeah. in another challenge that will come. Um, yeah. So, so uh, b b before we dive into some of the stuff you've gone through, so you, you sort of, that was, that was your first challenge you overcome, but you, here you are someone and a self-declared nerd that, uh, that hated PE class was, um, was afraid of water, navigated that challenge. But I think you've been humbled because now when we fast forward many years later, you are finally, you have finished your PhD. So you are Dr. Lena Toms. He's coming up. So uh, <laughs> congratulations on that. That's very recent. It's massive. And you're a professional triathlete. So uh, so that's a, a wonderful journey so far. I'd love to know when you first took up triathlon. And uh, t tell me that. What, what led you into this sport? Mm, a little bit of a coincidence. Uh, but, um, yeah, I did my first triathlon 10 years ago. Uh, I was... I think it was kind of to finish my swimming career. And then my plan was to go to uni and be a super nerd and not spend that much time on sport. Uh, then, yeah, I did did a race to kind of, yeah, finish my, my swimming career. And it was the Danish championships. Uh, and I was a junior at the time. And I ended up win winning the Danish junior um, yeah, championship which was because there were really no, not that many other girls. I think we were maybe three girls that com 
compute the the, the, you can the event. <laughs> yeah, you can exactly, exactly. But then, um, like two months later, when I had started university and had not started triathlon, uh, actually Rasmus Henning, one of your former uh, athletes, uh, called me and he said that he was starting a, a, um, a national junior squad. So I was as the national tra- champion on the national squad in a sport that I really didn't, yeah, do. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think I told him a little lie and I was like, yeah, 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 I train. And then I started training. Um, and uh, yeah, so then I kind of learned how to do triathlon. And a couple of years later, I was racing ITU. Uh, for yeah, for some course. yeah short course so French Grand Prix uh, World Cups and, and races like that so I did that between 2014 and 2016 um, yeah perfect so I'm I'm going to fast forward now and uh, uh, ITU short course racer professional uh, professional triathlete uh, in that level coming out of it's funny that it was Rasmus, but for the audience that don't know Rasmus is a, a legendary triathlete, multiple time Olympian, fantastically accomplished. I was very, very lucky to coach him for the last couple of years of his career. But um, but there you are. And, and here we are today. Now you're still a professional triathlete and you are a doctor as well. Great story over. Yeah. But no, we, we're going to talk about some chapters and episodes that you have navigated in your life, hopefully to paint a picture. And so this this becomes really important for the fabric of our story today. So I'm going to get to hand this off to you a little bit, and we're going to go through a, a few chapters. I hope that, as uh, as they sometimes say, ripping the scab off of this and, and the memories of this is, is not too, too painful, and it's struggling. But um, 2017, I want to start with this. And uh, and something that was uh, catastrophic for you with with your mum. And so, can you just uh, let the audience know what happened there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As you said, it, it was probably the biggest. No, it was it was certainly the biggest challenge of uh, of my life, and I think it will be for forever. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, my mom um, got a stroke and. Then she was in coma for half a year, and then she slowly started waking up again, and, and she is alive now, uh, but with some fairly big damages in her brain. And I think that was really a multi-sided challenge. Uh, I mean, first of all, losing your mom, uh, and in my case, also my best friend, when you're relatively young, and um, that's probably not easy for anyone. Uh, but more, more so, I also think the, the, what really challenged me in that in that period was the coma part of it, um, that waiting game, the uncertainty, and I guess really like the ultimate loss of control, mm-hmm. and being in that place between life and death, uh, yeah, it still gives me goosebumps right now. Uh, it, it was mm-hmm. some really freaky air to breathe every day for yeah months after month um even as a relative or yeah probably more so as a relative because she didn't know she was unconscious and it's something that i will i don't have a lot of enemies i don't think i have any enemies but but i really don't wish that anyone would have to go through that um but i think the yeah, to fast fast forward, uh, the biggest takeaway from that period is really learning to identify, accept, and live with uncontrollables because that was a period yeah. of full of uncontrollables. Yeah, and and you because I I I heard you say that word control in the middle of uh, in the middle of outlining that. And basically, here you were in a vortex of of uncertainty for many, many months. Uh, what what were you were you still trying to train for triathlons and continue with triathlons while this was navigating? What were you doing in the rest of your life at this time? 
Um, in the beginning, it was just before the race season started. So in the beginning, uh, and she she was a big supporter of uh, of my races, and she had um, she had uh, taken vacation for for my entire race season. Uh, mm. So for the races that we had planned together, and while she was still in coma, uh, planned that I should race. Um, I did compete in, um, but yeah then then slowly as i got into traveling and stuff like that i decided to stay home and um mm-hmm. yeah be be around my family and uh, just be be there uh, if she would wake up or, or when she would wake up and um so i still i still i i train at the national training center so i still joined the sessions and yeah kept some sanity uh yeah. from being in my usual setup uh so the only difference was that instead of going home after practice i went to the hospital and and obviously also uh, instead of more focusing on my own go- own goals trying to yeah, uh, be a part of the team and and see how I could contribute as a teammate into some of the other um, yeah at uh, performances. So so we could we could continue to unpack this journey and uh, and obviously it's a massive life event for anyone and uh, you know as you said losing your best friend losing your mum uh, at, at least uh, f- from a functional standpoint. And we can continue talking about this, but she wakes up, she uh, she emerges, life changed, life not back to normal. So so then what happened? Then uh, my partner at the time gets cancer in uh, eighteen. Uh, the first year was a relatively manageable uh, lymph cancer obviously still cancer uh, in the middle of his 20s. Uh, but um, then the second year, uh, his condition gets quite bad and he ends up surviving, but yeah, against on all odds. Uh, and he gets a bone marrow transplant in 2019. Um, and that was very unlikely that he would survive that, yeah? Yeah, especially, especially as it uh, developed, yeah. Okay, uh, and he managed to navigate through that. So, so now you're in this situation in life where you've had this, you know, year to year and a half of of everything that happened with your mum. You emerge, you take a deep breath, and your partner gets cancer, uh, navigates. But but by the second year of that is has real proverbial back against the wall. The odds of him surviving highly limited he manages to emerge on that you talked about with your mum identifying uncontrollables and almost being at peace with that saying like in america they'd say shit happens but uh that's obviously more than it but uh but you know ultimately identifying uncontrollables that that's what you talked about was there anything at the big level picture that came out of the situation with your partner how do you feel coming out of that as you on the other side of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I think probably, yeah, to add on that, identifying the controllables and really also act on these. So from a practical point of view, it meant that uh, we kind of both went wholeheartedly into what could we do in his condition. And... So we bought a very expensive alkaline water machine. Uh, in the periods that he was hospitalized, I brought him meals instead of relying on the cafeteria foods. Uh, it meant that we dressed up to go for a walk, even though it was sometimes even all, uh, only 200 meters and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, just focusing on what we could could do instead of kind of le- uh, leaning back and complain about how unfair the situation was um mm. like this active healthy really good light guy in the middle of his 20s get cancer uh 
it's not only once or twice that I've heard it's so unfair. Um, yeah. But leaning into that, like I mean, that's that's probably also a lesson uh, taking out from uh, we can take out from this is that life is not always fair, and if we dwell dwell too much on feeling, uh, yeah, that we are in in this unfair situation, at least for too long, then we will be blind on what we can actually do and then yeah to evolve from from the situation that we're in i think yeah that there's um there's a whole line of thinking in fact there, there's a backbone of of therapy which um there, there's a phrase that's borrowed out of cognitive behavioral therapy of so what now what <laughs> and uh, and it's a great one to use with your kids it's it's not fair and yes, but this is the situation. Now, how are you going to respond? And it's very interesting. You know, you, you just supplied some really, really practical stuff there that makes absolute sense from a logical standpoint. But many, many people would not actually sort of take that action of, goodness me, you're in hospital and the hospital food's terrible. It doesn't make any thinking, sense. Like they should have the best food available. But yeah, they, they no. absolutely should, and, and quite, quite, and quite often they don't. Yeah. And so, you took action and said, "But I can control that. I can, can change that, and I'm going to absolutely do everything that I can to ensure that the immune system is supported as much as I can. Making sure that you're dressed up warm, having the best water, whatever it might be. So it's actually very practical. So it's so a really anchoring around controllables, and. Um, and so you navigated through this and, uh, you know, e each of these I'm, I'm highly cognizant we could spend hours talking about and we, we, we give them five minutes service. Mm -hmm. But so you go through, let, let's paint the, the chronological uh, journey of it. You've gone through everything with your mum, so much of it out of your control, completely destabilizing. Then your partner navigates through the journey of cancer emerging against all odds and it really was against all odds that you came to that part of it we are now in 2020 in september and you went on an easy bike ride with uh with a couple of your your friends and teammates tell the audience what happened there yeah we were on a ride and they were they were doing a race on the weekend so they were doing some efforts i was just supposed to be yeah riding an endurance ride so they were up the road and then they would turn around to to pick me up and in that meantime i hit a bump and in like that shock that came up through the bike uh in that shock i lost the grip of of the handlebar and the next segment, I was just face first into the ground, which meant I basically only hit my head, but also did it um, very well. Um, I uh, fractured uh, jaws, two jaws, uh, both jaws, and I lost mm -hmm. five teeth. I lost uh, a quarter of my, my lips. Um, and uh, then I had yeah, the first 10 weeks I was completely wired up. So I, I basically couldn't open my mouth, but then it came in really handy that I uh, had lost the teeth because then I could get like a straw, a, a thin straw in between. So I could eat, at least uh, get some some fluids in. Um, not eating for, for 10 weeks, that's also uh, a challenge, um, especially when you don't like soups, but you got to yeah then you find a way to like soups um but yeah um i think the first thing i said when to to my my boyfriend uh, was that uh, yeah i'm never gonna ride a bike, bike bike again so i gotta find another sport because i'm also not finished with with lead sports so i will take up crossfit or something like that um but um yeah then uh, then also when i got back to and I started walking I started listening to some podcasts and one of them was the Patch Fitness podcast uh, and it really it really got me thinking like could I really first of all quit triathlon before I had even completed an Ironman and maybe more so do I really want to live a life based on fear um, and no 
I don't. Uh, so knowing that I couldn't go back to triathlon half-heartedly, I reached out to you, Matt, and here we are. But I think like the true challenge in this period was getting back on that bike. Uh, and and when we started working together, I had no idea of how difficult uh, it would be for me. And I guess you you quite quickly knew. Um, mm -hmm. So and the big big learning from this period was to like heading into this major challenge to really break it down into small steps. And it was ridiculous small steps uh, at some point. Well, when I go back and I reflect on that, because when, when we first had our discussion, you know, you have a, a coach athlete call and you paint this picture, ITU athlete in the, in the midst of um, navigating and finishing PhD. So going to be time star, very busy. And I had a crash and I've had a little bit of adversity outside of that. And uh, that, that seems fine. And I, I don't think I at all appreciated really the, the the fabric of the journey that that ultimately has been instrumental in building who you are as a person as a human being let alone who you are as an athlete and over the first few weeks that really started to bubble up and become clear and the first thing that i thought is hang on there's going to be some real post-traumatic stress at, at least i assume there has to be coming off of a bike ride like this and I think when we started, I wasn't even aware that you hadn't really ridden your bike yet. So um, so I, I really remember going through a step-by-step -step process. So I'd love to break, I'd love to break down because you talked about a major challenge into small steps. Let's let's just spend a couple of minutes on one small tiny part of that challenge, which was getting you back on your bike and doing training. Can you just outline briefly what that process was we obviously started on the trainer and then went from there but but i'd love you to outline what that was to start yeah so so obviously like the end goal was that i was able to ride fast and arrow in a race and probably more so also doing it without spending too much energy on being super tense and super worried about crashing again um, but we were so far away from that. Uh, it, I, I think when we started working together, it, it was in the Danish winter and I was really helped by that because that gave me time to have a lot of time on, on the trainer first. And then I kind of like, I made a list of, okay, these are the steps I need to go through. And obviously like the first one was being just out on a city bike, then being out on my TT bike, then take then, then taking a corner. So not like stopping on a corner and turning myself and then ride further, but actually riding a corner and um, mm -hmm. ride an arrow, ride fast, uh, ride a speed bump. Introduce intervals. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and I think, yeah, it wasn't until two weeks prior, the first race that at, at this time, I still hadn't been out on the bike. And then I was just like, you've got to do it. And there was also a voice in me that said, well, you could also wait till the race because then you got adrenaline and then you're fine. Uh, but I didn't lean that much into hope. Uh, so I I went out on the bike, I remember. And um, yeah, basically didn't breathe for, for uh, the first few minutes. And then... I think luckily we had had so many bike classes. Um, I joined mm. on like the Purple Patch Fitness Bike Classes where you over and over and over had repeated soft elbows, Lena, get that coat hanger out of your shoulders. And that really just became what I told myself for, for the next hour of that first ride. That was just, okay, soft elbows, soft shoulders, soft elbows, soft shoulders. And... Um, yeah, I got through that one and the next ra ra ride and a intensive ride and then the race. And um, yeah, then we are here. Well, what, what you highlight there is habit creation around posture, which is really important. Part of the value, and I sort of realize I'm saying this as the 
the leader of the coach that's leading the video bike sessions that we do at Purple Patch. But unlike being on a regular platform where you can just hide in your pain cave and uh, focus on the metrics, really being hounded by me, you in Denmark, me in San Francisco, on the proper posture and making that habitual, I think helped you move outside. And then from my standpoint, I remember your first bike rides, it, it, there was no anticipation of output, no anticipation of intervals. It was go and play on your bike. So try and learn to interact. And, and luckily you had the ingrained habits that then you could implement and, uh, and start to be more focused and, and highly successful, I'll add, um, as you come out of it. I mean, now as we sit here today, you're, um, uh, you are Danish long course champion. And uh, last year, was that accurate? Goodness yeah, me, as, mid as your middle coach, distance, but yeah, but yeah, middle distance. Yeah, that's right, middle distance champion. And uh, and you got a medal in the World Duathlon Championships this year, which uh, wasn't a bad start either. But this it could easily be a discussion as we sort of draw into our big lessons and <clears> and <throat> I think the real meat and potatoes of the meat and potatoes. But but I want to focus on one thing because it's really easy for us to draw lessons from things in our past. But right now, as we record this, you are in the midst of our fourth chapter of adversity and something that we never like to talk about, but you're currently injured as well and a really frustrating injury that's really, really challenging, both, both for you, obviously, and me, me as your coach, because it's sort of come out of nowhere. But you have a, a major knee issue right now, right at the point that we managed to, and I'll lead this section a little bit, but you finished your PhD, Dr. Lena Tarms, and you, we, we did such a good job of navigating training for a professional triathlete within a time-starved life. You achieve your success. Finally, we remove that shackles, the logistical shackles of obviously everything that goes into a PhD, and I'm free. Let's go and build an athlete, and you have a major knee injury. And so you are actually sitting right in the eye of the storm of adversity right now. And I think that's a, 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 a frustrating place to be, but it's also a, a great place to be to have this conversation. Um, and so where are you at emotionally right now when it comes to the knee and, and more globally you as an athlete? Yeah, um, I am on different levels. I think I am in a way, fairly calm in knowing that I'm right now doing what I can and I have accepted the situation. I have forgiven myself for whatever have caused it, even though we don't really know yet what has caused it or mm. what, what it is. But um, at the same time, obviously, it is a stressful situation to be in, um, as you say, just finished my PhD and and the plan was basically to be out there and train and raise my butt off and like I feel like for yeah for the last year that we have worked together it's always been like okay we we're just standing behind kind of the the start offense and now we can release the yeah, the hounds and and get out there and we still still standing here like the doors are open but we still we standing still right now, um, and uh, yeah. So so obviously, like I think that's that's something a lot can relate to. Like just kind of finding my feet uh, here with a new job uh, that is right now being a professional athlete, but being an inactive injured professional athlete. Uh, that that wasn't really. Uh, what we had planned and but it is the situation and even though it has been some months of uh yeah being like um back uh, uh of being yeah cautious and and not really moving forward and um, i think i am fairly calm in where we are right now and and we're doing what we can and and Luckily, I have a coach that is really patient and uh, uh, see possibilities. So that also helped me. 
Well, the, the um, it, it's, and let, let me see if I can say this the right way. For the first year of working with each other, there, um, uh, I, I think we can share this. There, it, immediately, we, we, from a performance standpoint, we were seeking performance within a framework that was very challenging for a professional athlete because you were doing a PhD. And yet within that framework, you achieved great success and great progression. And I always talk about performance predictability. And it, it took us almost no time to find our rhythm as a coach athlete partnership of performance predictability. And I, I think that almost in the Wizard of Oz way, you would, you'd be like, how do you know? And I, I just had as a coach, as I, I know this athlete, I know exactly what to do. I know what's going to build up great success. I, I had great confidence, great flow, great connection, even though geographically dispersed so far. I was like, this is really exciting because if we can do this now, think about when we are free of those shackles and, and we open the doors and here we are. Well, guess what? Here we are. And now, now we need to adapt. Now we need to lean into this situation. Now we need to recreate. And, um, and so obviously for, for me, it's incredibly frustrating as a coach particularly as I have great pride of, of a very, very low instance of injury. And I don't like it as no coach does their in, athletes to be injured, but it happens. It's elite sport and it's happened and it's something that's come out of the blue. I don't think it's uh, by any stretch your fault. Uh, you, you haven't done anything wrong, but we will manage through this and it's incredibly frustrating. But I, I think that with that grounding, we could stop this conversation right now and I, I can... Uh, almost lead the audience in saying, goodness me, that is a, a, a crazy journey of adversity. Your mum to uh, your partner's cancer to a catastrophic crash that many, many people would be um, hearing that and just thinking, I, I, I don't know how you could ever get back on a bike again, let alone get back to elite athletics. And then you're injured as a pro athlete. You're a remarkable human being. You have a, a a great perspective and and I, I want to hone in on I think your superpower which is your ability to navigate through this because really what it is for me is we all have our different buckets and stress and our recipe of stress and what stresses Peter and Robert might be very different than what stresses Jenny and Julian and and yet we all have to deal with this and so I want to come up a level and I want to hear your perspective on stresses and adversity, struggles, failure, because I think that if we have that as your grounding, if we spend 15 minutes now talking about this, I think it's going to be really insightful. So I want to start in left field a little bit. And Lena, as an athlete, what does success mean to you as an athlete? You, you, you've been doing this for 10 years now, but you've had massive life sort of pull away from it. So why are you doing this? What is success? What, how do you define success as a professional athlete? Mm, yeah, it's, it's a really, really good question. Uh, I think to me, success is about bettering myself. I really want to see how far I can get. Um, I, I want to like being able to identify where I can get better, then work on it. And then, yeah, then obviously uh, life uh, will take you through a test or you will take yourself through a test, like for example, competing uh, an endurance event. Um, so the road to success for me comes down to kind of the personal journey and on the on that journey, you will get tested and you will get challenges, challenges, and that's that's just inevitably, uh, inevitably, yeah, inevitable. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> My dang English here uh, in in life, and if you don't turn around and just run back on your couch when you meet the challenge, uh, then but you actually meet the challenge and look it in the eyes, then I also think that you will grow from it and you will better yourself. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is success. And that doesn't mean that I don't 
like success that I don't love to win. Like, you know, you can get me fired up on a challenge to win the, the Tuesday bike class, like a virtual ride with no prize money and no fame attached. But I'll always look back and judge whether I did my best, the best to my abilities on the day. And if I did, I'll sleep well in the night. Also, if I ended up getting beating, getting beaten by Andy on this Tuesday by class. <laughs> what, what, what you just said there around the personal journey <laughs> and leaning into the growth of, of the highest performers that I have had the privilege to work with, that is the most common trait that you have, the most common percep pers um, perspective. And I think that many people think that athletes and high performers are driven by outcomes. I want to be a world champion, but the best are never driven by them. It's fun and it's great. And, and of course, you ha might have a goal and you say, I want to win a world championship. What do I need to do to get there? But the real driver is, is always personal growth. And I think if... So I, I wondered what you were going to say when uh, when I asked you that question, and uh, and of course you answer with with absolutely no surprise. I I, I do want to with that come back with um with some I I don't want to let the crash go a little bit because uh, the the other stuff was life adversity and it's easy to segment, but the the crash was really directly related to your personal journey and challenge in the sport. And it was catastrophic and obviously very scary for you. So I want, what, what made you decide? You talked about this, about not living a life of fear. Was that the driver of you wanting to come back to the sport after the crash? You said originally, mm, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I said to Adam, I'm, I'm not going to come back. But then you did. So what made you want to come back? Yeah, I think... I think it was um, th that was the major part, um, and and honestly, there's also a major part in what we just talked about that I really don't feel like I have reached my full potential in in triathlon yet, and I'm just so eager to see what it is or just try mm -hmm. to explore that and and that's what really excites me in life and i like to act on what excites me and because that's where i feel like i kind of live to the fullest and obviously i know that there are risks involved in that um that i might end up uh, having a crash that where i don't lose i lose five teeth as the the yeah worst endpoint uh, in a way um but something worse than that um but yeah i i really would like to not die wondering i think you know that's uh that's a saying of uh, one of the great purple patch athletes laura siddle oh yeah Her, that's uh, right she's you will have it written on her hand. She's uh, one of my, uh, I, I have the greatest respect for Laura, obviously got to coach her for many years and her, her mantra in her heart is don't die wondering. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a great spirit. So, so let's, let's come up. And, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I just think like uh, with everything that has also uh, happened with, with my mom and with Adam, I, I'm, also more conscious now than five years ago that our time is limited and we gotta uh, get the most out of um, of the days we have. And right now I think, or I feel like I really get a lot out of my days when I dive into this triathlon project or my PhD project and yeah, so. That's also why. So, how would you, how would you define your relationship with adversity, setbacks, failure? Yeah, well, it's obviously never nice. It's it's never really welcome. Uh, I think there's never a good timing 
uh, or that's at least like the of all yeah all all the adversities I meet my first thought is god this is bad timing then my second thought is okay what can I do um but but I think especially like people like you and me and I'm sure a lot of the people in the audience are people that likes to move or like to move forward uh, in the world mm. and yeah. and a challenge almost always means that we are standing still or even moving backwards like the thing we really don't want to do right and it's yeah. certainly okay to acknowledge that but if we stay in that emotion for too long i think we are basically just setting ourselves back uh, and not the challenge itself and um, so yeah. yeah i think it's it's never really nice as i said when it come but i also think back to the french c'est la vie it, it is a part of life and uh, then i have also learned to quite quickly come into uh okay i really wonder what the lesson of this sorry shitty situation is mm -hmm. because there's i've there's always a silver lining that doesn't mean that i say like oh what happened to my mom is the best thing that ever happened to me because i learned x y and z like i would still yep. prefer it not had happened but it did and there have been some really, really great lessons coming out of it. Um, and for the lessons, I'm grateful. Yeah. It's a great perspective. Do you have a process of how you tackle it? When you, you've gone through so much adversity, th this might be a difficult question to answer in a way because uh, you, you probably haven't spent much time sort of thinking about it, but as the best you can, do, do you think that there's a process to approach these types of situations, situations of catastrophic stress or challenge or insurmountable barriers, or at least things that feel insurmountable? Mm. So if we say that all these situations have been stressful, uh, well, they obviously have been, but they've been a situation of stress in uh, in different ways and i think what i've what i have kind of learned is that it's it only feels stressful if i'm caught up in the future or the past because i you know like either be worried about what we haven't done or being overwhelmed by how on earth we are going to make uh, it into the future that we aim for and um, i think like happiness is also about letting go of what you thought your life was supposed to be and just embracing where you are right now and i think if we are stressed we're not actually present and if we're not present, we can also not be like truly happy. And I like mm -hmm. to be happy. Um, so I think uh, I've really learned to be more aware of what it means to be in the presence, because that really helps in sit stressful situations like these. Um, so in order to be present, to get me to the answer of your question, we gotta first accept the situation we're in. And I don't believe that we can truly move forward if we don't if, if we haven't first accepted what we're in. And then secondly, forgive ourselves or the universe or whoever we blame. I think you should always try blame yourself, right? But but forgive ourselves for whatever happened and then try to determine some focus on what we can do and then actually to the present part act on what we can do and then for the future or for a better future then consider okay what went wrong and is there anything we can do about it uh, 
then try to change that and, you know, learn from that, apply it into to our future lives. And, and what, uh, what about people around you? How important, as you, as you reflect on some of the situations, how important of uh, friends, mentors, coaches uh, playing a role? Uh, everything you talked about there was, was actionable around you. Have, do you feel like uh, people around you have, have uh, been helpful in the, the growth through that situations, those situations? I, I I'm not sure where I would be if I didn't have my my family and my teammates mm-hmm. and other friends and then meeting one like you um to to kind of have my back and take my hand and go with me through whatever uh happens uh, I really hope that anyone have or everyone uh have uh, have people to to go through life with both the ups and the downs and yeah like for example we also talked about like i stayed in in the training environment and uh, that was really really nice for me or really good for me to have that very normal side of my life uh, next to a also more uh, k or, or, or through the chaotic phases of life mm-hmm. um even though it has also been challenging sometimes to be around them be- and and it honestly it comes down to a uh, comparison uh the, the enemy of mankind uh when you start to compare your own life with with others um because honestly and, and they know we have talked about this uh they were living, my, my teammates were living the life I had set myself up to. And I clearly remember some of the sessions where we we would go grind and have fun doing it. And then they would go home and rest and do another session. But I would be going to the hospital. Uh, and I'm really not normally a, a, jealous, a jealous person. But I got to admit, there were a few occasions where I was just like, oh, my God, can we please just switch lights uh, just for, for one day? Um, and, uh, I think luckily we were close enough friends that I was able to say it out loud and they would still know that I wouldn't take anything away from them. And they absolutely deserved being, uh, where they were in their Triathlon career or their uh, academic career. Um, and probably like, uh, 360 days a year, I also focused on, that I was a part of their journey and and so on. Um, but I think something that I think is actually really important is that when 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 in my situation when I got caught up in thinking oh please just let's let's just switch lives and um, then I would sometimes move on with uh, with an experiment of what like I would call the the complete switch. So. Let let's take an example uh, to to kind of the All audience. Right. I'll go um, with you here. Yeah, I'll okay, go with you here. Yeah. So you've trained with your best bot, John, and you're racing an Ironman, and then uh, your big goal is to qualify for for the World Championships. And then three days before the race, you get hit by a car, and you can't do the race. And John ends up finishing the race, going to Kona, uh, and all you can think is like, God, I wish I could just switch lives and I, I could go to Kona instead of John. Okay, fans square, emotion. Uh, but but let's say then, okay, you get the Kona slot uh, instead of John, uh, but you also got to take his annoying wife and his chubby ankles and his weird running style. And you also got to give up your own kids and your family and your specialized bike and your coffee machine. Mm-hmm. Do you still then want to switch lives? I, like w- whenever I did that experience, I was like, no, I'm fine. Like yeah. I, I just want my own life, and it's it's obviously not really down to to the coffee machine, you know. But yeah. Well, I I was persuaded after just the coffee machine. That was the thing that tipped <laughs> me over the edge. But that, that's a great perspective, particularly as I saw your coffee machine, and you have the same one as me. So that's uh, <laughs> you are a woman of good taste. So so to finish. I'm going to give you 
I'm going to give you a floor. Two, two minutes here. If you're with the audience, your key lessons from all of the experiences, if you had to wrap it up and you said adversity, it happens in life, you've given so much already, what are the key one or two lessons that you want to share with the audience around navigating adversity? Mm. Yeah, i got to be quick here. So I think my biggest one is perspective. There's a 99% likelihood it could be worse. Uh, and to quote Gary Wee, one billion people don't have access to clean water. So to have some issues with an E or, mm, yeah, obviously right now, just several races being cancelled and uh, not a lot of income and quite a lot of uncertainty right now uh, that I'm being a, a pro, like, yeah, it stinks. It really stinks, but, but still, goddamn, it could be worse. I still wake up in a soft bed. I can make myself a triple espresso from a very good coffee machine if that's what I want. Uh, my friends and family are here. Uh, I can go out and ride my bike with my teammates. Uh, uh, after two years, I still have dentists that are working on making my face look as pretty as possible after the crash. And uh, like in Denmark, I've, I've been paid for 10 years to take an education. I mean, don't get me wrong, I would still right now like to not be injured, but it could be worse. And this too shall pass. C'est la vie. This too shall pass. And this too shall C'est pass. C'est la vie. Yeah. What a great way. Well, my, my last thing I'll tell you, Lena, um, outside of thank you and thank you for being so open and honest, uh, I, I think you're remarkable as a human being, but, but you mentioned something about going on a journey to, to find your potential. And you, you mentioned in the discussion, I don't think I'm there yet. Let me tell you as your coach, you ain't nowhere close. you got a big engine and we're going places. And uh, and so this shall pass and we will emerge. And I'm excited for your journey ahead. But uh, I, I appreciate you so much. Uh, I, I have so much fun coaching you. And uh, and, and I really appreciate you being a part of, of Purple Patch and the, the whole community. So let's get you healthy. But... For today, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. Mm. Yeah, now I'm speechless. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Cheers. Guys, thanks so much for joining and thank you for listening. I hope that you enjoyed the new format. You can never miss an episode by simply subscribing. Head to the Purple Patch channel of YouTube and you will find it there and you could subscribe. Of course, I'd like to ask you if you will subscribe, also share it with your friends. And it's really helpful if you leave a nice positive review in the comments. Now, any questions that you have, let me know. Feel free to add a comment and I will try my best to respond and support you on your performance journey. And in fact, as we commence this video podcast experience, if you have any feedback at all, as mentioned earlier in the show, we would love your help in helping us to improve. Simply email us at info at purplepatchfitness.com or leave it in the comments of the show at the Purple Patch page and we will get you dialed in. We'd love constructive feedback. We are in a growth mindset as we like to call it. And so feel free to share with your friends. But as I said, let's build this together. Let's make it something special. It's really fun. We're really trying hard to make it a special experience and we wanna welcome you into the Purple Patch community. With that, I hope you have a great week. Stay healthy, have fun, keep smiling, doing whatever you do. Take care.